Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 590 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 27th of November 2021 as I record this from my quarantine hotel room in Auckland in New Zealand which I will talk about in a minute but just in case you're wondering why the sound is a little bit different. (laughs) So in today's show I'm talking to MK Williams about well lots of things, (laughs) how to break through the mindset issues that hold us back, how you need to give yourself permission to write and publish without waiting for external validation, imposter syndrome, and how patience is the key to the craft and business of writing. We also talk about financial independence and podcasting as book marketing or interviews that you can do on podcasts as book marketing, as well as turning a blog or a podcast into a book. So that's all coming up in the interview section. In publishing and book marketing news, well, before I flew out, I attended the Future Book Conference online, which was attended and it it was actually in person as well. And it was attended by big publishers and independents. And it's usually a good reflection of what is on the industry's mind. And this year it included a lot on green and sustainable publishing, as well as subscription models, AI for audiobook narration, (laughs) featuring Google and SpeechKey, and also a session from Creatokia on NFTs. Now, once something is featured at Future Book, it's usually in the early stages of adoption in traditional publishing. So we definitely have a few years before they adopt all of these things. But obviously, I've been covering these various issues in recent shows. So it was, I guess, some validation that these topics are being considered by other people (laughs) in the industry. Now, Michael Tamblin from Kobo did a great keynote. He is always very entertaining. He did it uh, via video from Canada. And while some spoke against subscriptions, Michael said that the world is now used to subscription services for content. And of course, Kobo just launched various markets for Kobo Plus, which is non-exclusive. Now, uh, what Michael Tamlin said was, will consumers start to compare the cost of streaming for a month of all you can eat versus the cost of a single book? He said, if they do compare, things will get spicy. (laughs) And uh, Marcus Dole, the CEO of Penguin Random House, said that he thought subscriptions were not good for author income or for retail and not good for creating the future of long form reading for future generations. Now, of course, there are always pros and cons either way, but I'm with Michael Tamblin. I don't think subscriptions are going away and therefore we have to embrace them. Consumers love subscriptions. And as I've said before, I'm a consumer on the subscription model. I'm sure you are. And in fact, here in quarantine, (laughs) here in our quarantine hotel, uh, we are certainly binging on all the subscriptions that we have. And uh, of course, it's not about just English speaking environments. Uh, Juggernaut CEO from India, Cheeky Saka, said that subscription is uh, basically a one click model. She called it frictionless consumption. The, cu- the customer doesn't need to think. They just look through their app or whatever it is and they find something to read or watch or listen to. So, yeah, basically it's happening. So how can we make the most of subscription? There were also several references to the rise and rise of indie authors. Academic John B. Thompson said that self-publishing is a parallel universe alongside traditional publishing. It has altered traditional power structures of the publishing world. And I've actually felt that for a long time. And in fact, it was J.A. Conrath. If you've been around in uh, in the indie space for a while, you'll know of, of Joe Conrath. But he said quite early on, it's like a shadow industry. 
And most of our statistics aren't included in any of the sort of publishing company things. Our revenue isn't counted. No, it all it kind of exists in the shadows. So, uh, and in fact, <laughs> I heard the other day from um, someone <laughs> uh, who said, oh, I've heard from publishers that writing, I think they even said it, but like paranormal romance doesn't work anymore. And I was like, that's absolutely crazy. Traditional publishers are saying that because indies basically now control the whole market <laughs> for paranormal romance romance. So when publishers say, oh, that genre doesn't work anymore, it might well be because indies now sort of have taken that over. So it's this parallel universe idea, which which is interesting. Also, Emily Marnier from Bonnier said that Amazon KDP and Amazon Publishing, APUB, have changed the landscape. It's empowered authors to have more of a choice. The range of publishing models has expanded and has led to the increase in digital royalties. And finally, Michael Tamblin also said before the pandemic, one in five sales on Kobo were indie authors. And now by sales, indies are within a few percentage points of the biggest publishers. So together we are holding our own, <laughs> which I, I just loved. It was so interesting because I've been going to Future Book for, oh gosh, almost a decade now. And uh, it's always interesting to me. Often in those early days, I was kind of looked at as a sort of a kind of strange outlier. And now we're talked about in this pretty much positive way, which is lovely. Also on the green publishing side, I I had that um, chat with Denise a a week or so ago, but they uh, shared various presentations. And one presentation shared that 42% of emissions in the publishing supply chain were down to returns, which of course, most indie authors don't do. So once again, print on demand is a better model. And finally, they did have a few authors speaking. Author Roxanne Gay talked about money on one of the panels, saying that publishers should stop overpaying for books to help boost author earnings. Instead of giving one author $2 million for a book that will never earn out, why not give five authors, why not split that between five authors or 10 authors and make that money go further? Also, there's considerable waste in marketing, in printing and sending galleys to people who barely look at them. Roxanne said, the money is there, but the money is rarely where it should go. So I thought that was an interesting roundup. But certainly, um, if you look at hash future book 21 on Twitter, you'll be able to see some of the tweets that were shared that day and uh, some of the slides and, and all that kind of thing. I definitely find it a useful conference every year. And it's good to sort of get a feeling of what what the industry's looking at and certainly the probably the biggest focus was on audio audio both in the subscription side but also in the ai side ai narration side so interesting times as ever So my quick personal update, I am here in Auckland in New Zealand in a quarantine hotel guarded by the military (laughs) and only allowed out the room for 30 minutes a day, walking very slowly in one direction around a tiny car park uh, or allowed out the room for the mandatory testing. Now, since I usually walk a lot every day, I am finding it pretty hard to be honest, but we are counting down to be let out and then we will see our friends and family. Jonathan hasn't seen his mum for over two years, so that's why we're here and uh, it's, a, it's, it's not a holiday. This is not a trip I would have done <laughs> without the real necessity of seeing family and I, I know all of you probably feel the same and uh, sometimes you just have to go through these things. So counting down to be let out. Uh, my novella, Tomb of Relics is out this week. So I'm also trying to sort out various launch things, which for me are pretty low key, to be honest. Uh, I'm trying (laughs) to do technological things on hotel Wi-Fi in a hotel with lots of other people. It's fun, fun, fun. Uh, But uh, MK and I obviously today on the show talk about patience. It's not something I'm very good at when it comes to slow internet, because at home I have super fast internet. (laughs) But I'm I'm learning things about myself whilst in quarantine. Some of them not good, but there you go. I shan't talk about that anymore. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. Obviously, I've I've had um, I pre-recorded and put out quite a lot of shows <laughs> even in the last couple of weeks. So a couple of comments on the Green Stories interview with Denise uh, Beyond Dragon says. 
thank you for this, like a breath, a breath of fresh air. It's nice to find I'm on the same page as others in adding eco concepts and solutions into their stories. I'm doing this in the fantasy series I am working on now. Uh, On the Alan Baxter interview, Gary says, sometimes it feels like you have a new episode every week for the exact information I was just Googling. (laughs) Uh, Gary says, every time I attempt a short story, it ends up becoming a much larger story. I can't help developing all the characters. So I've been looking for tips to, to sticking to the short story formula. So fantastic. Glad that helped. And uh, Talina Winters says after the in, uh, the interview with Talon from Deep Zen, she says, holy cow, my expectations for the AI narration on fiction were low, but I'd never know William wasn't a real person. I'm still listening and I'm blown away. Seriously considering this option now. Deep Zen has brought the future to the present. Glad you thought that way, Talina. And um, if you're interested in listening to the AI narration, have a listen to the last episode where I share both fiction and non-fiction samples that Deep Zen has done for me. Also, a question on my AI, the AI assisted author course. Lana asks, is this about getting machines to write stories? I have to admit, I'm, I feel instantly depressed about it. <laughs> So I wanted to answer this in public because if you are considering my mini course, the AI assisted author, it has one, it has sort of how many sort of 17 different videos, all the different ways that we are already AI assisted and the ways that we will be AI assisted in the coming years. And there is one on shorts, one on um, poetry, one video on fiction, one on nonfiction, and then the rest are all the other different ways. (laughs) including things like editing and video and audio and all these different types of things. So it's more about working with AI tools in the same way that you already use a lot of AI tools, like um, you, if you use Amazon <laughs> or Google or Pro Writing Aid or all of these other things. Anyway, I know my course is not for everyone, but uh, no worries if it's not your thing, but give it a go if you'd like to know more about being AI assisted. So you can tweet me at the creative pair with a double N and send me pictures of where you're listening hopefully not in quarantine (laughs) email me joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the youtube channel i love to hear from you it makes this more of a conversation So today's show is sponsored by ScribeCount, new sponsor, recently referred to as the tool that pays for itself immediately by Mark Leslie. And from my perspective, I use ScribeCount to check book sales and revenue across the ebook retailers so I can see how my books are doing in one report, which no other reporting service provides this easily. And believe me, I've tried many over the years. Whether you are Amazon exclusive or publishing wide, ScribeCount provides both the at a glance view you need for everyday sales tracking and quick, easy custom reporting to review series sell through, advertising effectiveness and more. For those who are wide, ScribeCount pulls sales data from all the major platforms, as well as aggregators, draft to digital and Smashwords. It compiles the data into one user friendly interface to provide a great overall look at your library. Print sales in the UK, ebooks in South Africa, hardcovers in the USA, it's all right there. What used to take hours can now be done in minutes. Exclusive to Amazon, ScribeCount has a dashboard for you as well, streamlined and focused on the things select authors need. Ranks, pre orders, and reviews are updated every 15 minutes. You can choose to see page reads displayed as a sum per book or automatically converted to full reads. And with Ingram Spark and ACX coming soon, you'll be able to see your sales in one place. Do you sell books through your own website or on a small platform, maybe at the latest conference or even out of the trunk of your car? No problem. With ScribeCount's income and expense features, all that data can be entered in to appear in your charts right along with your regular sales income. Sales numbers are great. Net income is even better. And for part-time authors, it's deeply satisfying to see your sales increase month over month compared to your day job. So if you want to use the tool described by best-selling author Wayne Stinnett as quicker and more accurate than going to the source, simply log in, enable the platforms you wish to see and let ScribeCount do the rest. Head on over to ScribeCount.com.
And yes, I do use Scribe Count and I absolutely advocate them. So yeah, go over, check it out. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time in creating the show and all the extra in between episodes are supported by my wonderful patrons. Thank you so much to everyone who's been supporting the show for years. And thanks to new patrons, Cheryl Rosario, Dandy Serenity, which is a wonderful name, Charlotte and Cherie. Thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for months and years. I really appreciate your support. You can support the show with just a couple of pounds or euros or dollars or whatever currency (laughs) a month. And you will get the extra monthly Q&A audio. You also get some behind the scenes stuff. You get to ask your questions. You get money off all my ebooks and audio books and courses. You can support the show at patreon.com. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. M.K. Williams is the author of eight books across multiple genres, including dystopian sci-fi, literary suspense and non-fiction for authors, as well as a coach and creative entrepreneur. So welcome, M.K. Hi, Joanna. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you. So let's get started. Tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and publishing. <laughs> well, it was a snowy day in Indiana when I was born, <laughs> um, but I've I've loved reading my entire life. I was an only child, so books were a great source of entertainment. I loved to write. I had my angsty teenage poetry phase, which... Oh, me too. Makes, yes, <laughs> so many of us do. And I got to college and I picked the safe major that was supposed to guarantee me a great job, but I was still able to take some creative writing seminars. And I was very fortunate in my writing killer fiction, which was the title of the course, to have a professor who really encouraged me to keep writing. And so when I graduated into a lousy economy with no job prospects, um, my hobby just became writing. Um, And so I really enjoyed starting to do longer form fiction and felt uh, with that professor's encouragement that I could write a novel. And I kept going for that. And that novel was finished and I you know, did what I had to do and go start pitching agents, right? That's what you're supposed to do. And every rejection and every bit of silence was, okay, well, that's just one more no until I finally get my yes. And then I wrote another book and did the same thing. And uh, surprise, surprise, I never heard anything. (laughs) And then I finally went to an in-person event with a local author here in Florida. And I was just thinking, this is it. Somebody else who's an author, uh, we're going to become best friends. We're going to do like writing together. We're just going to commiserate. This is it. I'm finally going to have an author friend. And the opposite of that happened. And so she looked at me and she said, you're what, 23? What could you possibly have to say? And (laughs) yes, yes, to my face, she said this. Um, And I was 24 at the time. So I was flattered for maybe a minute that she said I looked like I was 23, but then the rest of it was pretty horrible. And so I just was very defeated from that. It wasn't the that traditional publishing wasn't responding to me, that I wasn't getting any agent responses. It was more that lack of author community that really shut me down. And my husband at the time noticed I suddenly wasn't writing. I wasn't spending every free second trying to to get things into my Word document. And he asked what's going on and you know, traditional is not working. Why don't you try self-publishing? And it was 2013. And so I told him, no, you don't understand. I can't self-publish because then, you know, all these reasons. And he said, okay, well, prove me wrong. And so I went online intent to prove him wrong. And I found information on KDP and Smashwords and this entire sea of information about self-publishing. And I said, you know what? I think he might be onto something. And that's kind of where my journey as an author really kicked off of instead of asking for permission to be an author, I just said, I'm going to learn this and and become an author. So that's Mm. how we got here. I love that. And I did a blog post about that really early on in my career. I like stopped asking for permission because I think that's, I don't know, we've known each other for a while. I think maybe you're a bit like me. We're, We're good girls, right? We want to do the right thing and traditional publishing seem like the right thing, but you need all these permissions. And it actually takes a bit to rebel against that and say, I, do you know what? I don't need permission and you don't need the permission of that author who said that nasty comment, which mm-hmm. is really bad. Like we should all encourage everyone. I mean, it, I just, it makes, that makes me so crazy. That really does. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what's so interesting is that I'm, I guess, a very bad millennial and that I wasn't looking online, like on Facebook, on forums for this community, that I let that one person in person kind of shut me down when so many of the great resources that are available now 
are so encouraging. And I think that's helped me as well to have more confidence um, in that. No, this is right. I can keep doing this and I can keep growing and learning. Mm. But I think we still want acceptance from Mm -hmm. our peers who live in the same area, right? I feel like Mm -hmm. that is still something that this is one of the issues for indies is really this peer acceptance in a physical community, whereas we have this great community online. (laughs) Not many of us have a physical community, especially not in these times of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or you go to something with other aspiring authors and you say, oh, I'm an author. And they say, oh, so you've got a publisher. And I just say, I sure do. She's great. Best (laughs) person you'll ever meet. (laughs) Um, Because there is this idea that you can't say author without the qualification of self-published, but really it's the book gets out to the reader the same way. Now the quality of self-published books are so good, the reader probably can't distinguish. So why do I have to put a clarification or an asterisk next to my title? I I shouldn't have to. And oh, I deal with that um, imposter syndrome all the time. I'm constantly battling it. I can sound very confident right now, but an hour from now, I'll be quaking in my boots like, I don't know if I can do this. So we all are on that roller coaster. (laughs) Yeah, that never stops. It's interesting because I I guess um, Gen X and you're a millennial and I kind of was hoping that millennials would have broken out of the stigma in inverted commas, but maybe it will be Gen Z or whatever we call that, you know, younger generation or like you have a a, a baby, maybe by the time your baby is... (laughs) At school, there won't be a stigma anymore. Who knows what school will be by the time your baby grows up? (laughs) Perfect. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, she'll get to brag to all of her friends that her mom's an author and I'll volunteer for the Scholastic Book Fair and I'll do all the the bookish things. (laughs) Oh, there will no way be book fairs by then. Uh, Or they'll be in the metaverse, for example. Anyway, digressing. (laughs) But I I wanted to, so you you've basically been uh, on this journey now, I guess, then for over a decade the writing Mm -hmm. and publishing journey and you help others publish too and so what mistakes have you made that you've learned from in order to grow as an author? I think so I was thinking about this of there's three big categories right there's craft mistakes there's marketing mistakes and business mistakes I've made and I think they all kind of boil down to patience um, is when I've been impatient to say, you know, with that very first book I put out, I just wanted it done. I was so sick of it. I was like, nope, I've been waiting. I know what I need to do. I just want this out. And inevitably the first book, uh, I think I've heard the quote, if you don't hate your first project, you launch too late. (laughs) And when I look back on nail biters, I cringe, not just because it's a little scary, um, but because, you know, it was the worst quality. I think my quality has improved since then. And I think it's still good, but I look back and I think, wow, I really could have done with taking, um, more time to really go through and have a second editor come behind and really giving myself the time and not setting an arbitrary date of, I just want it out by this date. Having that patience really would have helped me. And I did actually go back and take a remedial English language course through Coursera for free. And I was the only native English speaker in there, but I know where to put commas now. I feel more confident with it. (laughs) I still (laughs) do. Yeah. I mean, my editor still has a job, Um, but yeah, I definitely had to swallow my pride and learn a bit more and accept that I'm going to keep learning each time and I won't be perfect, but that patience has helped. And the same with my marketing. I just had no patience for email marketing because that was my day job before I became a full-time author. And I still don't have much patience for email marketing because it still feels like the job part of this job, but I know that that's important to do. So I have to do that. So yeah, a lot of my mistakes come down to not being patient, not being as focused as I should be on the full elements when I just say, but I just want to play and write, or I just want to get the book out. And that's led to the the biggest issues. So going back, taking a moment, making a solid plan has always helped. And so I've had to learn that. And now I try to teach people that too and say, don't repeat my mistakes, make a plan, be patient. Fun. Yeah, some people can't plan. Uh, I mean, that is, I, I've been learning much more uh, recently about our various strengths. And I feel like obviously I've got a book on your author business plan and, and I do plans and I love plans. <laughs> But like my husband just doesn't plan. It it drives me up the wall. But it's interesting. You mentioned they'd be getting sick of email marketing, not enjoying it because it feels like the job part of the job. 
But this is the truth, right? For people mm-hmm. who are doing this full time or want to do this full time, there are tasks that you have to do that are the job part of the job. And you mentioned the writing is more play, which is mm-hmm. awesome because you have to keep that part of it. You don't want a job that you you hate, but we do have to accept that things, some things you don't, you can't enjoy everything, right, about what you do for a living. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And I think even on my worst day or the days where I have to do just the most email marketing for this job, it's still 10 times better than my old career. So I have to remind myself of that. I can't have it all. There has to be some work days or some some difficult, frustrating times. But I think that's that's part of it. And I'm yeah, I'd still pick this job over any other one. So how can we cultivate patience? I practice, I think. That this is the hardest part. And even with the authors that I work with, it's that patience of, hey, like your ebook link is showing. The paperback link's not going to show for a couple more days as it gets through, you know, Ingram to kind of show up on Amazon. Don't send the link. And they're like, but, but, but. And I'm like, no, don't do it. Like, I will tell you. And it's almost, I feel that I, what I do when I help authors is I'm almost that buffer of like, I will tell you what button to press and when. So now I'm becoming your patient's checkpoint of don't send anything. Don't do anything. I'll tell you when the link is ready. Um, because of that excitement and wanting to send it prematurely. And I tell them, I'm like, well, if you send the link when there's only the ebook, then people think, oh, it's only an ebook and I want to print. And then when you remind them two days later, the print's available, they don't go back. So I I become that, that buffer. So having somebody to help you do that can help or just, um, I use Asana as a project manager and I will put dates in there. And so I tell myself if the date is in there, that's the date it gets done. I don't jump the gun. I don't delay it. That's the day it gets done. And so it's kind of understanding where your own issues are, where your own short shortcomings are as an author, as a business owner to say, okay, I need somebody to help with this. I need a system to help with this and fixing for it. Everybody is different. You know, some of us are planners, some of us aren't, but for the people who aren't planners, find somebody who is as an accountability buddy say, okay, my, my task management software, my Trello, my Asana, that's my accountability buddy. So kind of getting to know yourself, which is of course the the lifelong objective. We all want to know ourselves, but really trying to figure out what's going to work for you. And there's going to be trial and error with it. And it's not always going to be perfect, but always aiming for that patient planning, well-executed. The more we strive for that, the better we get each time we release a book. Although I will be devil's advocate on this and say that I think that people who just do this in a very messy way... (laughs) can also be successful because patience is also a longer term game. So mm-hmm. even if it takes you three months to put out your ebook and then the paperback and then figure out that you need an email list, or if it takes three years and well, for example, I, it was sort of, what was it? 2012, I think I rebranded my initial fiction as JF Penn and started building an entire another brand. And so we all make these uh, decisions slash mistakes along the way. Uh, But what's so great about being indie is that you can fix it later, but you do have to have that longer term patience, as you mentioned, Mm -hmm. for years. It's not just patience for that launch link. That's a kind of short term patience, but also this longer term patience that, look, it, you can't have a career with one book, for example, mm. your first book. It's very <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I am often the dream crusher when I tell people like, you're not going to quit your day job off of the first book. Maybe, maybe by the fifth, like, they, you know, aim, aim for that. Don't put too much pressure on that first book. <laughs> yeah. So c- coming to money, because of course, if you want to be a full-time uh, creative entrepreneur, then you do need to think about the money. And you and I connected at the Choose FI podcast and FI standing there for financial independence. And money is this super emotive topic. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And many authors struggle with finances. Like on the one hand, they want to sell a million copies and make a million dollars and, you know, whatever. But on the other hand, they don't actually want to talk about the details. So what's your money story? How did you learn about money? And what are some of the principles you follow now in terms of managing it as a full-time author entrepreneur? Yeah. So money is definitely this very taboo topic in in most of our 
societies. You don't talk about it, whether you have it or don't have it. And so for me, I've always just been frugal. My mom jokes, I still have my second grade lunch money somewhere um, <laughs> saved. So that was just my my nature. And I, I think I was very fortunate that I met my husband when I did. We both had debt and we were both very focused on paying it off and very quickly, I guess, enabled each other. We said, okay, well, instead of going out to dinners and dates, we'll cook in, we'll go to parks, we'll do that. And we definitely bonded and connected over that. And then we paid off our debt and we thought, well, now what? We all this money we were shoveling towards student loan and, and a mortgage. Well, what do we do with it? And I think we were very fortunate to find early retirement extreme and Mr. Money Mustache uh, about that time talking about this crazy concept of, you know, if you save enough money and invest it, you don't have to work till your mid 60s at a corporate day job. You can leave earlier and design the life you want or have some variation in between. It isn't this all or nothing. You work and then you quit working and you never work again and you sit on the beach with your umbrella drink. And so at that point, we thought, oh, well, that would be nice to be able to take the pressure off of these long careers that could be very demanding of us. And for me, the idea was sparked of, well, maybe I could buy back some time to try being a full-time author. Because even, even then, early on, I was writing, I was enjoying it. I was trying to get everything together to self-publish, but I thought like, this is a whole extra job on top of my day job. And I really wanted that. So that gave me that focus on what was a priority to me. And I think for authors out there who are struggling with a financial element, I think what they first need to do is figure out for their personal life, what do they value? And then spend their time and their dollars there. If you say, well, I value time with my kids, I value time with my family, I value my time writing, but you're spending your time and your dollars on things that don't get you there, then there's a time to kind of pivot and and reframe it. And that, that's what I do. Like for me, I value my time with my family. I value my time writing. And so I don't spend money on TV subscription services, which is crazy. I think some people are like, wait, you don't have Netflix or Hulu or any of that? Nope. Don't, don't have it because I don't spend my time there. So I don't spend my money there because there's only so many hours in a day. And that's just one little thing that I do that works for me. So I think authors, we need to define what we want and what we need. And obviously having my personal financial house in order helped to make the jump to full-time author easier, right? Like no, very few people are going to be the multi six-figure authors within a couple of years, right? It takes a lot of work. And sometimes that means leaving that solid, nice corporate salary that comes in every few weeks to say, I'm going to go the entrepreneurial route. There's a roller coaster. You get paid not regularly. Sometimes you have to track down somebody to say, hey, you owe me this payment. You know, things are lumpy. And so having that financial basis, a strong foundation to that financial house has made that transition easier. And now I make a, a solid salary. Like, you know, I'm not going to be going on any luxury trips on it, but I have a salary and that's that's fine for me for where I am. And I do think my FI roots, my frugal roots have maybe held me back in some cases where there could be opportunities to invest in a certain writing software or different technology or take this course to learn to do ads and put money there. And I've been very slow to um, adopt those because of that frugality. And I think, yeah, maybe it's held me back, but at the same time, I don't have any sinking holes on my profit and loss statement. So I think it's worked out for me, but for others who are very frugal, I, I feel your pain. There's always something new coming up for us authors to buy or invest in or spend money on. And it's very hard to keep saying no, or let me think about it. But I think the let me think about it gives you space to say, is this the right purchase for my business right now? Or is this good for later or just not for me yes well you you covered a lot there sorry <laughs> I'll come back on a few things so uh, yeah it took me eight years to get to six figures so just in case people are interested uh of which five of those years were still in my day job so five years of working both jobs and then left my job in 2011 and in 2014 I made six figures and then 2015 and moved into more which was very good but it, it so it takes a long time I think that's important and then I also I love your frugality but when I was the age you were being frugal I was spending all my money on good times <laughs> So I would say to people, and I, I think I'm a proponent of what they call fat fire, which is an un unfortunate thing. There's lean fire, which is the frugal one, and the fat fire, which uh, I love, which is, you, you mentioned value, and I think that's what the important thing is. So I we do spend money on restaurants, for example, mm -hmm. and when we can, we will spend money on travel, but we don't have a car 
for example, and we live in a, you know, a, a lot, a house that's a lot less than we could have bought. And we focus on what we love to spend money on and mm-hmm. then invest the rest. So there's lots of different ways to do this, but I guess our overwhelming recommendation is that you learn about yourself, but also learn about money and understand your own money story and how that impacts your life now. And then you can make changes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know a lot of people, when they start to hear about the concept of FI, they look back and they think, oh, all these money mistakes I made. But the good thing is like, you can make more money. There are different ways that we can find a job, do a side hustle, sell some books, um, (laughs) and you can overcome those financial mistakes, right? There's nobody who's too far gone if you feel like, well, I want what what MK has. I want what Joanna has. I I want this full-time business, but my money past is is holding me back. It's only holding you back as long as you're allowing it to. If you learn, if you find that option, um, you know, I was so frugal when I started, I was like, okay, I'm going to buy my ISBNs. I'm going to pay for a cover. How am I going to do that? I did freelance writing articles um, for a health and website. And the most notorious one was how to peel a banana. (laughs) <laughs> was the most ridiculous article I ever wrote. But you know, they paid me for that. I um, did email marketing on the side because that was my day job. I did that too and kind of got that extra cash that way to then pay for those ISBNs and that cover. So there were little things that I did to kind of jumpstart. And then now I'm just reinvesting those royalties all the time into the business. So it, it takes a while. It takes a little um, grit, a little elbow grease, as they say, but it can definitely be done. Mm. And if people are interested, I've got a book list at thecreativepen.com forward slash money books, which also has podcasts on. And one of those podcasts, again, is the Choose FI podcast. And coming to that, you've been part of the podcast production team and involved in many interviews, including my interview on the show. So I wanted to ask, because I mean, book marketing these days, podcasting is so valuable. Uh, I mean, it must be becoming more mainstream because I get pitched like <laughs> by traditional <laughs> publishers and PR like every day. But what are some tips for authors who want to pitch podcasters? Yes. So I I helped on the production side for several years. I'm now just helping on their publishing arm. But I I too have read through many a podcast pitch and some still find their way to my inbox. And I will say the there's several no-nos I, I would suggest. And the first one is don't ever send an unsolicited manuscript don't do it. <laughs> yeah. What, like, why? <laughs> why? Yeah, don't, don't wait till the person writes back and says, oh, that's a great topic idea. I'd love to read your book. Then send it. If they haven't made that ask, don't send it. I would say also keep your pitch short and simple. I mean, there's really big podcasts and even to um, a certain extent, smaller podcasts, they are getting inundated by pitches. And so if you wrote a novel to be able to pitch. Don't write a novel in that email, you know, short, maybe three to five bullets of topics you can talk about because that's where their eyes going to go first when somebody's reading through the pitch. And then they'll look through the window dressing of who are you? Why are you going to talk about this? And I would say, obviously, podcasts help to market books. And I know every week you talk about uh, comments people leave where they say, hey, podcasts sell books. I bought the book that was on your podcast. So that's that's great. But you want to make sure that you're providing value to the audience first. If you are going to the podcast host and saying, I have a book coming out. I want to promote it on your podcast. Eh. Hey, I have a book coming out about XYZ topic. Your audience can learn from what I have to say about that topic in these ways ding, ding, ding. You want to provide value to the audience first because that helps the podcast host because they need good, valuable content. And then by the end, people are like, oh, that person knows what they're talking about. I think I'll buy their book. If you get on the podcast and you just say, well, in my book, in my book, in my book, mm. people tune out to that. that. That's annoying too. So it's focusing on the value you can give to the audience first. And then people will say, huh, she sounds pretty smart. I think I'll go I'll go check her out. So it's always that focus on the audience as your primary focus. Yes. And in fact, now I use Descript to edit my shows, because, which is when you load up the audio and it has it in text. So you can actually edit text. If someone keeps saying in my book, in chapter three, I talk about that, Joanna. I'm like, yeah, that's coming out. So I will actually edit out those things now and but it annoys me if I have to edit it out (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) because Mm -hmm. you shouldn't have to say you know just answer the question you don't have to say in chapter three of my book I said this no (laughs) (laughs) just answer the question in a really useful way and I know some probably newer authors or people who haven't done much of this kind of media worry about 
giving away the farm, but we both know you can give away the farm in your podcast interview. You can give away the secret and people will want the book, you know, to read mm-hmm. the detail. I think that's super important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So if you provide the value, people will still want to endorse that. And I know within the FI space, uh, I, J.L. Collins wrote The Simple Path to Wealth. And he's very commonly said, everything in my book, you can find on my website, but there's people who don't go to my website. So I put it in a book. Now he Mm. obviously did a lot of editing and making it polished and good for book form, but he still sells so many copies of that book. So yes, giving it away for free on his blog has not hurt his book sales. So it's reaching people where they are. And again, it's always comes back to that value. If you if you give people value, they're going to appreciate that. And then they want to support you regardless of whether they've already got all the information from the book. They think, I, I like what that person has to say. I, I want to see them succeed. Look we'll at their book. Yes, because and a podcast transcript is very different to mm-hmm. a book. And mm-hmm. this is interesting to me because, as you said, you helped the Choose FI with their publishing arm and you've helped a number of podcasters and mm-hmm. bloggers publish their books. And we also both use content marketing in our businesses. We understand this. But when is something an article or a video or a podcast alone and when is it part of a book? And How do you turn that kind of content into a book without it sounding ridiculous or being massive amounts of work to turn a transcript into a chapter? Yes, it it is a good a good amount of work to be sure. And so I would say something in my mind becomes a book when you feel that oh, I have 10 videos or 10 articles that I could maybe string together and and fill in between here and that's that's real out of content. Some of the bloggers I work with, they do 1000 to 3000 word articles. Well, even the shortest book that I would consider a book is about 25,000 to 30,000 words. So if if they're stringing these together, okay, they need to have at least 10 solid pieces of content there that needs to flow together. And then I think, okay, this could work. But the the benefit of blogging and podcasting is as things change, you can update it. If the topic changes too frequently, if there's too many updates, for example, I'm working with somebody now on a book about the solo 401k, which is an option for retirement savings here in the US, but the tax laws are potentially about to change. Mm. Um, and so they said, oh, I, I want to wait to update the manuscript till that's done. And I said, well, is this going to happen every year? Because if it is, it maybe shouldn't be a book because then you're constantly chasing yourself. And so having those kind of you know upfront conversations, but I think it's the volume of content. It's the breadth of the topic that determines if it's a book versus just a, a video or a podcast or an article. And to the point of not making it uh, too difficult and uh, to reword it and, and rework it, I've noticed a few patterns of, of bloggers when they are converting to a book. And that's the blog speak that mm. is there. The way you speak in a blog is much more um, it should sound like that person's talking to you. They can almost hear your voice in their head with little mannerisms and you'll end a paragraph with lol, facepalm, um, or whatever they're talking about. You probably wouldn't put that in a book because blog readers are different than book readers. Now, some people will read both, um, but people who only read blogs look for one thing and people who only read books do not like blog speak. And they will let you know in the reviews and comments that they do not like blog speak. So it's going back and cleaning up some of that informality. Um, you can't do memes or GIFs in your book <laughs> for lots of reasons. Um, you could put so, a QR code link to them. <laughs> you could, you could. Um, but it's one of those things where I, I try to work with some of the bloggers to say, how important is this funny GIF to you? How, how important <laughs> is it? Is it going to take somebody out of the flow of what you're doing? And you know, links are, are an option in eBooks but not so much in print. And I find a lot of bloggers that I've worked with are thankfully very good at citing their sources in text, right? They're in the blog and they'll hyperlink out to the source article for whatever data they're presenting. I'm like, that's great. In print, you need a bibliography. Mm. You got to just click on all those. And the best bloggers I know are very good when they're talking to people at promoting their blog. Hey, I talk about this on my blog and other things. Go check it out. And they they have to do that, right? If they want to monetize their blog, they need traffic. Um, it's then coaching them in the book and giving them a maximum of two blog references. You can mention your blog once at the beginning and once at the end and nowhere in between. <laughs> um, <laughs> because they're very good at saying, hey, check out this other article on my blog. Check out this, check out this. Um, somebody who buys a book is going to be very frustrated at, I just spent how much of my hard-earned money. And this guy keeps telling me to go to his blog. They want to feel that they got the value from the book. And again, when they really enjoy the book content, they will go to the blog and read other items if that is a goal for the author. So 
that's one thing I I would suggest any bloggers or podcasters who are listening go through really critically and say for the the book reader who's never heard of your content before, is this the best representation to get them to like you, want to cheer for you, and want to check out your content versus just a marketing ploy to say, go to my blog, listen to my podcast, bye, 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 whatever the, the item is. Yes. And I... I can definitely tell if something has gone blog to book without enough editing. And and probably my best tip is if you want to go from blog to book, you know, do your best you can in the manuscript, but then print it out as if it was a book in physical form and put it in a folder like we do with all our books. Like at the moment, I'm just hand editing um, a Tomb of Relics, my, my next novella. And if you go through and hand edit a book, you will and read it end to end. I feel like you'll be able to pick up the issues around flow. And as you mentioned, I feel like that's one of the biggest issues. I actually don't mind the sort of lol face palm thing. I don't mind that um, relaxed speak, but I can definitely tell that things have either been written as separate pieces Mm -hmm. or as a flowing whole that takes the reader on a journey and with a book you are taking the reader on a journey Mm -hmm. and it's and this is the other interesting thing about audio because people say oh well someone can just use the table of contents and skip to the chapter they're interested in but if you're listening on an audio book they are unlikely to do that. I mean, sometimes, but I listen to a lot of audiobooks and it is a journey. It goes <laughs> from the beginning to the end. So you need to make sure you structure that. And I feel like bloggers, they'll be like, okay, this week, it, it, usually you don't structure a blog from beginning to end because you change and time changes. And, mm-hmm. and you're like, okay, well, that article on mindset, for example, is really useful, but I wrote that a couple of years ago. And then this is something more recent, but you, but the book has to flow. And I, that's probably the biggest mistake I see. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that was the reason that I the guys at Choose Fi asked me to come in was they had this podcast. They had mapped out the first, I think, dozen or so episodes were very linear. And then it was no longer linear. And they kept telling people, go to this episode to listen to our guide of the episodes listen to in order. And they're like, if we put it in a book, we can guide people through this journey of of the thought process you have to go to. And I do, I appreciated that they had that mindset going in because it made it much easier to work with them through the editing process. So absolutely, it is should be one cohesive journey for the reader, whether it's a, a fiction book, a nonfiction book, a guide, a cookbook, whatever it is. I mean, even cookbooks, you start with appetizers and you go to desserts. Um, it has, that's to, a has good, to flow. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that annoys me, I mean, people do this to me sometimes. They'll email me and say, hey, can I put the transcript of our conversation in a book I'm like well technically you can but why would you because as a reader I do not want to read a transcript Mm -hmm. that's just I just don't want to do that and if you do want to use it I have used transcripts in a appendices in my public speaking book like some excerpts from you know, discussions that were valuable, but they went in the appendices. Again, if you think about audio, I think about audio all the time now. You can't read this stuff out loud. It sounds ridiculous. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the same thing I find with um, bloggers who are very, they like their graphs and their charts because it's visual. Mm. And I, I feel like I'm constantly reminding them like, have you explained it well enough in the text that somebody listening to it isn't going to be frustrated that when they get home from their commute or wherever, they have to go online to look at this graph? Yes. Um, the text should be doing the work for you. The, the graphs and charts are window dressing. Um, and I think that's a good rule, whether it's ebook or print format, but it's especially important with audio is the image supports the text. It does not do the work for you. That is a really good tip and also important for all those people who say, oh, I want to put loads of photographs in my book. (laughs) It's like, again, I mean, yes, maybe that goes in the limited edition print that you want to spend money on, Mm -hmm. but in it means nothing in audio. And remember, I mean, obviously we want to be inclusive and it's for accessibility, but it's also for people like me who want to listen to your book rather than read it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I have a saying with my clients that every word in your book has to pay rent and every picture, ha- they're at the penthouse level of rent. They that, that picture really has to earn its place in your book um, because yes, accessibility, audiobook, um, it's more expensive to print with images. It's going to make your ebook file heavier. Like There's lots of things that go with that. So that's why I say the rent for images is much higher. So if it's paying rent, it can stay, but if it's not paying rent, it's got to go. 
Yeah. And obviously we're, we'll um, exempt you for things like uh, recipe books, like you mentioned, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> children's books, blah, blah, blah. Yes, yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah. if you're <laughs> sitting there, comics, graphic novels. Yes, we understand. But, you know, yeah. just the, the, the vast amount of narrative. OK, so we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you about your site, Author Your Ambition. And I feel like ambition is one of those words, a bit like money. It's a really difficult term. So why is it important to be clear on our ambitions at different stages of the author business? I think it's super important for a lot of reasons, but I think the most important one is that if you, as the author, if you don't have a clear ambition or goal or vision or focus, what, whatever word you'd like to use for that, um, if you don't like ambition, if you feel odd about that, but if you don't have a clear ambition, goal, vision, focus, a guru will be happy to sell you one. <laughs> and it will not be yours. And I I constantly feel that there are so many new authors in the space who are so excited. They're very earnest. They say, you know, my goal is to get the this information out to the world. I know it can help people. Or my goal is to to write this book and show my kids that this can be done. Um, and they have this very altruistic goal. And ultimately what happens as they, they go through and they listen to more information from different sources is, well, I need to launch on this exact day so I can hit this list and all these other reasons. And that's going to help them get XYZ dollars. And what I always say is that it's okay to have the altruistic goal of, I want to prove I can do it to my kids. I want to help the world with my message. And it's okay to have the financial goal of, I want my book to at least earn back what I've invested. I want my book to fund XYZ um, extra side hustle dollars or to go full-time as an author. It's okay to have both of those goals, but one of them has to be the primary. So ultimately, you'll have to make decisions as an author that come down to, well, which one's more important? Is it the the nice altruistic, warm, fuzzy goal, uh, reaching your creative challenges and things like that? Or is it the financial goal? And, and there will be a time where there are decisions to be made where those two are in conflict. And so one of them has to be the priority. And so if you start out on this process and you haven't written down what the goal is, you haven't really taken the time to define it, it will get murky. And by the end of the process, you'll just feel like, well, did, did I do, am I successful? Did I, did I do the thing? I think I did the thing um, because the work never ends for books. So there's really no set date to say, hey, measure success, yes or no, unless you draw that line in the sand and you define it. And I've seen a lot of authors get burned out because of that constant hamster wheel of, I have to do all the things. Well, you have to do the things to get you to your goal. And maybe for the next book, you set a a different goal and and the next one and the next one. Otherwise, yeah, you'll burn out and you won't have the patience for this long author journey. And that makes me sad when I see that happen to people because it's so fun to launch a book. It's the most exciting day ever when you get to finally hold your book. And I want that joy to be there without the burnout. Mm, no, me too. Which is, um, as we record this, I just put out the relaxed author with uh, co-written with Mark Leslie de Fave, and that was one of the reasons we did it. It was because there's so much kind of hamster wheel running in the indie author world, and people mm-hmm. think that that's the way you have to do it. Whereas, of course, it's not. And you, you know, your ambition. You mentioned spending time with your family. Like the ambition could be to work less <laughs> and that's yes. that's probably where I am at this point and also for example I started out with leaving my job goals and financial goals I still have financial goals but I also would like to win an award as a fiction writer and that's a very specific goal that is uh, it's out of my control ultimately but all mm-hmm. I can do is focus on developing my craft to the next mm-hmm. level and submit to awards <laughs> so <laughs> you can do different things at different points but so so what are your ambitions as you continue on the author journey so yeah right now my ambition is to have an adaptable business you know when i left my corporate job i had my writing work had been fit into these little hours and pockets and then it was my full time you know, all, all day job until my daughter was born last fall. And now I am fitting my work into two or three hours a day. And as long as I can continue to do that for the next few years until she's in preschool and, and grammar school, I will be very happy. So I am looking to scale back my business in certain areas, do less of the work where I have to be in the chair and do have more passive lines of income in terms of making sure my YouTube channel is getting the information out to people. So if I'm not available to work with you one-on-one, great. All my information is on my YouTube channel. It's in my books. 
It's available Mm. at so many different places, so I can still be there to help people, but I'm maximizing my valuable time that keeps getting shorter and shorter every day to be able to have the life I want. And then, yes, when my daughter goes to school, I will happily ramp it back up again and do all the, the things we're supposed to do as authors and things like that. So that's my ambition right now is a business that is sustainable long term and adaptable. I think that's great. And I also, I, you know, I'm happily child free, but when I had COVID a few months Mm -hmm. ago and was quite sick and it, you know, went on for a while and I felt the same way, like so super grateful that my business is adaptable and makes money without me actually having to do very much at all. I, I wasn't able to do much really for a month or so. And I'm back to full strength as we record this and um, excited to be back out at a hundred percent going fast. But as you said, I mean, having a child and or children, if you go further, uh, that's what you want to spend your time doing. And mm. your writing is a, a different point then. And obviously time passes and the kids leave home and, and you want to have these different stages in your life as well as your author business. It's, it's so important. And cu- circling right back to the beginning, we talked about patience and I think that's what it comes down to, isn't it? It's patience in every area of our life, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's understanding that this current moment won't last forever, Mm. whether it's a frustrating moment when I think I just need to get this done and she won't take her nap. Please go to sleep so I can get some work done. Or the moments where I'm thinking, you know, things are good right now in the business, but it's not going to be like this forever if I don't think strategically on the business and I'm just constantly in it. So I think the fact that life and our our businesses are always changing, always gives us the opportunity to reassess and plan for the future and really design the life that we want. And that, that was part of my five journey. That's now part of my author journey is, you know, in five years, if, if my life is exactly the way it is right now, will I still be happy or what will be missing? And really thinking about that critically And it's so hard in our society just to take the time to have those thoughts, the leisure of just sitting and and thinking about what do I want in the future? What's right for me? Because there's always so much to do in our author business and our lives. But the best growth comes from asking those tough questions and positing those tough hypotheticals and then making the changes necessary to get you to where you want to be. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And uh, you have lots of interesting stuff. So where can people find you and your books and everything you do online? Yes. So I'm all over social media as at one, the number one MK Williams. I used to say it's because I'm the one MK Williams, but there is a male author who's based (laughs) in the UK who's also named MK Williams. So if you find MK Williams and he looks like a dude, that's not me. I'm the one who looks like a girl in front of a bookshelf. With a smile. So yeah, I'm one of Williams.com, author your ambition.com. Um, you can find from there my YouTube channel, um, my books, uh, my author your ambition series of books for first time authors. The latest one, which is coming out November 2nd, is Going Wide, Self-Publishing Your Books Outside the Amazon Ecosystem. And you can find all my fiction books on 1mkwilliams.com if you're into science fiction, a little scary, a little fun. I've got something for everybody. So brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, MK. That was great. Thank you. So I hope you found the interview with MK interesting and that it gave you some things to think about in terms of mindset, money and a long term view of your author business. Next week, I'm talking about writing hooks and improving your fiction book description with Michael Brent Collings, always a welcome guest on the show. And I'll share one of my descriptions that Michael Brent has helped me rewrite. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.